เมื่อเซอร์วินทองมิสเตอร์สปีกเกอร์เซอร์ขอบคุณทุกคนที่ได้พูดในการแสดงความร่วมมือในบิลก่อนที่จะเข้าสู่การแสดงความร่วมมือที่เกี่ยวกับคำถามที่มีประโยชน์ต่อประชาชนขอให้ผมยกตัวอย่างสองประเด็นต่อไปประเด็นแรกคือเราขอบคุณที่ได้ประโยชน์จากการแสดงความร่วมมือในบิลก่อนที่จะเข้าสู่การแสดงความร่วมมือในบิลก่อนที่จะเข้าสู่การแสดงความร่วมมือในบิลก่อนที่จะเข้าสู่การแสดงความร่วมมือในบิลก่อนที่จะเข้าสู่การแสดงความร่วมมือในบิลก่อนที่จะเข้าสู่การแสดงความร่วมมือในบิลก่อนที่จะเข้าสู่การแสดงความร่วมมือในบิลก่อนที่จะเข้าสู่การแสดงความร่วมมือในบิลก่อนที่จะเข้าสู่การแสดงความร่วมมือในบิลก่อนที่จะเข้าสู่การแสดงความร่วมมือในบิลก่อนที่จะเข้าสู่การแสดงความร่วมมือในบิลก่อนที่จะเข้าสู่การแสดงความร่วมมือในบิลก่อนที่จะเข้าสู่การแสดงความร่วมมือในบิลก่อนที่จะเข้าสู่การแสดงความร่วมมือในบิลก่อนที่จะเข้าสู่การแสดงความร่วมมือใน Dealing with a scenario where, in most, if not all, of those circumstances, the clients involved are likely to be sophisticated clients, understanding the commercial context and appreciating the need for this, and at the same time, putting our lawyers who compete with foreign lawyers for international work to put them on the same platform so that they can also, like their foreign counterparts, go in to make a bid for work on the basis of using CFAs. So we start with that principle, and uh, to take up Mr. m u r l e p e l e s point as we study, and we have not completed our study to extend this to other proceedings. We will carefully decide. We'll, we will consult widely, and in the same way as uh, Mr. m u r l e has said, we have done leading up to this bill. We will continue to do so, all stakeholders, and we will decide at that stage whether an, uh, an extension is appropriate, and if so, with what kind of additional criteria as safeguards. And as members will know, even with this framework that we have put in, uh, in a cautious manner for sophisticated clients, we are already putting in safeguards here. So that's the first point I'll make about the framework. The second is I've heard several comments about the agreement. Should we regulate the agreement? Should we put in this uh, a pro forma? Or should we put in uh, some standard terms? I've also heard. I'm sorry. Thank you very much. I'm sorry. I also heard um, Mr. Joshua Raj Thomas say earlier that we should also have a fee structure that allows lawyers to negotiate, and that, in his words, is best appropriate to the complexion of the case. And this really is the reason that behind the CFA, to let the parties decide what are the triggering requirements to allow a party to decide when uh, an uplift would be appropriate, depending on the context of the particular case. And I think it is in this context that the interests of the lawyer and the client can best be aligned, not separated, but best be aligned. And um, despite that, we continue to have oversight of, over the agreement, because just as we have done in Part Eight of the LPA, for agreed fees, not CFAs, but agreed fees, the court continues to retain a discretion to have an inquiry into an oversight of these of these agreements. Likewise, in the context of the CFA, that remains the same. So the courts will still have oversight of the uh, uplift, and in Mr. m u r l e y s words, to determine it based on the reasonableness of the case, the context of the circumstances, the relevant weightage of the risks taken, the complexity of the case, the length of the case. All of these are factors which the court takes into account, which is why it would not be possible upfront to state you can only uplift by X or 2X or 3X. Because it may be appropriate in some cases, it may not be appropriate in other cases. So that's the second point I would make. The third point I would make is throughout uh, the member speeches, I've heard that because this is a new advent, a new development in our in our framework, we should be given guidance. Certainly, I think we've committed to doing so upfront. That's the reason why we've we've consulted extensively, both open as well as closed, and we will continue to do so and work with law society to ensure that. Lawyers and users alike, clients, are familiar with the, the framework, and as far as we can, provide guidance which doesn't tie the hands of solicitors as they negotiate these CFAs, but at the same time give guidance as to what the framework requires of the CFAs. So, with that, let me now uh, address the specific queries raised by members. Mr. Ng asked if CFAs would be allowed to act in international mediation proceedings. That do not arise from permitted categories of arbitration or litigation, 
My ministry is currently assessing standalone international and domestic mediation proceedings holistically as part of a separate ongoing study of the CFAs. The potential benefits that CFAs can offer in the use of mediation has to be viewed against the interplay between international mediation proceedings and domestic mediation and litigation proceedings. So, for instance, at present, there's no clear delineation in existing legislation between mediation proceedings that are international and those that are domestic. If parties to an international mediation do not reach a settlement, the dispute may, be, may proceed to be heard in the SICC or in the High Court. <clears throat> As CFAs will presently not be permitted in the High Court, this may then create an ambiguity for lawyers and litigants uh, given that proceedings on one stream in the High Court will not be allowed for CFAs and those at the SICC will be allowed for CFAs. Further mediation proceedings that are more domestic in nature may involve litigants of a wide range of profiles and that needs differentiated treatment and protection uh, for the reasons I mentioned earlier. And so this requires some further study and consideration. For these reasons, to answer Mr Ng's point, my ministry has assessed that it will be prudent to consider standalone international and domestic mediation proceedings holistically as part of an ongoing study of CFAs. Second, Mr Ng asked how the CFA framework will take into account cases that are commenced in one fora and then transferred to another and whether it is possible that a case may be commenced in a forum where CFAs are permitted and then transferred to another forum where CFAs are not permitted. The answer to this is as follows. Where proceedings are transferred between two fora in which CFAs are allowed, for instance, from arbitration to related court or mediation proceedings, then obviously the CFAs will continue to continue in the, in the case of the solicitor and the client. So CFAs will be allowed in those circumstances. Generally, otherwise, CFAs are not permitted in cases which are transferred from or to a forum where CFAs are not permitted. So in the particular example that Mr Ng highlighted about High Court and the SICC, for the time being, CFAs will not be permitted for proceedings that are transferred from the High Court to the SICC and vice versa. We will study this further and consider whether we should change this, but as a starting point, under this framework, as long as one of the part, one of the proceedings, either from which it is transferred or to which it is transferred, does not allow the CFA, then a CFA will not be allowed. This approach uh, towards CFAs and a transfer of forum will avoid any unintended consequences and risks to litigants arising from CFAs, uh, and we will make clear the position in subsidiary legislation. Mr. Murali asked about the circumstances of enforcement by the court in, with reference to pro the proposed section 115D, uh, 4, and I think 7 of the bill you mentioned. The sections referenced by Mr. Murali are aligned with the current 1133 and 1137 of the current LPA in terms of the court's powers to deal with contentious cost agreements. The CFA is, in a sense, a contract. I, mean, I made, made a point earlier that parties should have freedom of contract to negotiate the terms of the CFA. And it should be enforced by the court like any contract if the requirements in the proposed 115B of this bill, which sets out the regulatory framework and the requirements of the CFA in this case, have been complied with. And also, of course, if the CFA is not found to be void, avoidable for one of the grounds listed in 115D. On taxation of costs, uh, solicitor and client costs under the CFA, Mr. Zulkanen asked whether the proce taxation process in court will still be applicable in respect of solicitor and client costs under a CFA. He also asked if disputes regarding the validity of CFAs would fall under the scrutiny of taxation proceedings or if they should be subject to separate court or arbitration proceedings. Generally, sir, solicitor and client costs under a CFA are not subject to a taxation. This is provided under Section 115C5 of the Bill and is similar to the position for contentious business agreements under the current Section 1124 of the LPA. If there are questions, however, on the validity or the effect of a CFA, parties should bring an application to court under Section 115D2 of the Bill. Under, that, under Section 115D5 of the Bill, if the court finds that a CFA either does not satisfy the statutory requirements or is found to be void or voidable, then the cost under the CFA can then be assessed in accordance with the rules applicable to taxation. Mr. Zulkanen also sought confirmation that lawyers agreeing to CFAs would not be held personally liable for adverse party and party costs under a CFA unless there are circumstances of personal or professional conduct that attracts <coughs> personal liability for costs. That's correct. Under a CFA, a client will continue to be liable for any costs, orders 
that may be made against the client. This will also be clarified in subsidiary legislation. On Mr. Zulkanan's query about the disclosure of CFAs, BRB regulatory obligations such as SGX announcements or audited financial statements, let me reiterate again a point I made at the start of the reply speech, that the CFAs really are an additional fee structure. It is an agreement that allows lawyers and their clients to work out a fee structure. CFAs are not intended to change, nor do they change any existing statutory or regulatory obligations relating to disclosure from what is expected if normal fee agreements are entered into by companies. So in assessing whether you need to make an, an announcement, the usual criteria would, would apply, whether it is material in the particular context of the circumstances of that particular announcement. Companies and lawyers will still have to make an assessment and assess the extent to which a CFA will need to be disclosed in the context of existing guidelines and the regulations governing disclosures. Mr. Murley asked how concerns relating to CFAs that have been highlighted in the past. I think Mr. Murley cited some past speeches and past examples have been addressed. First, dealing with potential conflicts of interest. I had again mentioned how in the context of a proper CFA, in this case at least, uh, the sense is that the interest between the solicitor and his client in the CFA can be aligned. But to M Mr. Murley's point about a potential conflict arising, because of a direct financial interest in the outcome of the litigation. Mr. Murley also asked whether a lawyer may advise on a settlement instead of litigation in order to settle the matter earlier and receive payment. This is not withstanding that the client will receive a lower amount than what he may reasonably expect if the matter proceeds to litigation. Mr. Thomas also highlighted a similar scenario. I think he used the phrase uh, under settling. Uh, if, uh, if parties have an agreement and you choose to decide that there will be a payment based on a settlement, then obviously if you define the terms of the settlement not below a certain amount or at least containing these terms, that I think will protect the client's interest to ensure that there's no undersettling in this case, not just any settlement, but a settlement that comports with the client's interest in the outcome. Under a CFA, the standard expected of a lawyer in advising how a case should be conducted or proceeded on remains the same as that of a normal fee agreement. So what I said earlier in my opening speech about the relevance of the legal professional PCR rules, they continue to apply. Amongst others, Rule 17 of the PCR requires lawyers to explain a proposal of settlement clearly and properly to a client or any other offer or position taken by another party which affects the client. At the same time, the lawyer must also evaluate, together with the client, whether any consequence of a matter justifies the expense or the risk uh, to be undertaken. So if you choose to proceed with a the case, there must be an assessment by the lawyer that this would be in the best interest of the client. Bearing in mind, obviously, that in litigation, there are various vicissitudes that you can't control, points which Mr. Thomas and several other members highlighted. If there's a reasonable prospect of the client recovering a higher sum of money in litigation as compared to settling the matter, such that pursuing litigation would justify the expense of doing so, the lawyer would be obliged to advise his client of the same. And I think these are principles which many of the lawyers uh, who have spoken would be familiar with. Second, the prospect of increased frivolous litigation and raised litigation costs from CFAs. Several members have touched upon this. We expect that the introduction of CFAs would, on its own, per se, be unlikely to lead to an increase in frivolous litigation. In CFAs, the remuneration of lawyers is, de depends on the successful outcome of the cases. Generally, lawyers are also rational economic actors, and they would likely have little commercial reason to support frivolous or weak litigation. The risk of little or no likelihood of monetary return for their efforts would, be, would not be commercially justifiable. Further, as lawyers may have to fund the litigation until its conclusion, or at least a portion of it, there is likely to be less tendency to pursue all possible avenues at, all, at, at, at any cost, uh, and a greater tendency to be more cost-conscious on the contrary and cost-effective. At the same time, to assuage members, the experiences of other jurisdictions also lend support to this. Members might recall that I said earlier that we took a cautious approach. We studied the approach in other, other jurisdictions and learned from their experiences. For instance, in England and Wales, data suggests that CFAs have not caused an increase in unmeritorious cases. A study on the impact of CFAs in clinical negligence cases over a period of 10 years showed that there has been an increase in cases, but over a period of 10 years from 2006 to 2017, 
I think even in Singapore, we saw an increase in cases. So it's not because of the CFAs. But what's important is that the proportion of successful claims in this period did not change. In fact, there were more successful claims funded by CFAs. This underscores the role of the CFAs in enabling the pursuit of meritorious claims. Studies in Australia have also showed that there had not been a significant uptick in unmeritorious suits since the introduction in their jurisdiction of the CFAs. And we believe that Singapore's experience is not likely to be different. As mentioned in my earlier speech, we will also be implementing rules and safeguards to minimise the abuse of CFAs. On whether litigation costs will be raised, let me reiterate that existing professional obligations continue to apply, and this includes the rules against overcharging. Even if the CFA provides for the payment of an agreed fee, the PCR pro prohibits overcharging, a point I made earlier, even in the context of today's rules on agreed fee without the uplift. If the lawyer cannot in good faith charge the fee, taking into account factors such as the nature of the work done or legal work concerned, and the time necessary to undertake the legal work points which Mr Murley made, then these are factors which will be taken into account by the court when assessing the veracity of the agreed fee. We believe that legal costs will continue to be moderated and also adjusted by the market itself. If a client finds that the lawyer's fees are too high, they are free to engage another lawyer who may offer a different range of fees and different uplift formula. Lawyers are also free to adjust their fee arrangements to better place themselves in competition. And Mr Thomas had himself alluded to this in urging for lawyers to be allowed to negotiate terms appropriate to the complexion of the particular case concerned. Mr Murley asked what would constitute a fair amount for lawyers to charge as an uplift so that this would not be viewed as a case of overcharging. I think I covered this in my initial remarks and I think what we want to do is to say that uh, we don't proscribe how parties may choose to structure their fee arrangement, the CFAs, but at the same time have oversight by reasons set out in the framework with requirements that they must fulfil, uh, including the cooling off period, including the fact that this, them, it must be in writing, and also ensuring that parties do not agree a fee that is based on a proportion of the returns uh, from damages or otherwise in the case itself, which then has no correlation to the effort by lawyers. But say for that, I think as Mr Murley says, look at the reasonableness in the context of each case. I would say this, that um, the mere fact that there's an uplift is not a reason, not a reason for setting aside the agreement. That's the whole raison d'etre behind the CFA. I would add a further point that uh, when you have limit on uplift fees in other jurisdictions, they are typically legislated because the fee arrangement in those jurisdictions extend to access to justice type of litigants. They help access to justice uh, indigent litigants to access the courts. And in those cases, uh, you more likely find a cap on the amount to which you can uplift. In this case, at least at the start of our framework, we don't apply the framework to those types of cases and those types of litigants. And so, a for Chiarai in our case here, we don't see a need to put a limit on the fee arrangements and the uplift amounts. But as I mentioned earlier, if we expand our framework into other types of cases, this will be a fresh consideration that we will review at the appropriate time. Mr Zulkanen asked uh, about other protection mechanisms for litigants and what safeguards are available for a litigant who has entered into a CFA with a lawyer and thereafter changes lawyers or whose lawyer decides to withdraw from the case. My first response really is to ensure that as you prepare the CFA, structure the terms uh, which will cater for these eventualities. Sometimes parties change lawyers, sometimes there might be changes in the way in which the case proceeds. It is best to ensure that as far as possible, in terms of an agreement, you cater for these scenarios up front. So lawyers and their clients should discuss and provide for how and when the CFA may be terminated. And if it is terminated before the conclusion of the case, how would the remuneration structure and what triggering conditions would apply in those cases? And this, I would say, is no, no different from a current uh, traditional fee arrangement that is based on either time costs or conclusion of certain milestones and so on. So 
parties should deal with this as a matter of agreement. Where a client changes lawyers after a CFA is entered into with the first lawyer, Section 115F contemplates this scenario and provides for the consequences of such a change. Either party can apply to court and the court will have the same power to enforce or set aside the agreement as if the change had not occurred, having regard to the relevant terms of the CFA. With regard to fees payable to the first lawyer, the court may order the amount due in respect of anything done by the lawyer under the CFA to be assessed. So there could be a scenario where before the conclusion of the case, a lawyer is discharged, but a substantial amount of work is done, the court can then make an assessment as to what amount would be appropriate under the assessment to be paid under the CFA for this lawyer. The principles are largely similar to existing principles relating to contentious business agreements as set out in the current Section 115 of the Legal Profession Act. Where a lawyer withdraws from representing a client under a CFA, existing rules under the PCR will also continue to apply. This includes an obligation on the lawyer to take reasonable care to avoid foreseeable harm to the client, such as giving reasonable notice and cooperating with the client's new lawyers. N none of these uh, will change with the CFA. Mr. Thomas asked about the importance of guidelines and possibly training for lawyers. I think I'd covered that. We will do so, and we will ensure that there's sufficient guidance for the market once this is in place. We will um, take into account the topics highlighted by Mr. Thomas. Some of them will be addressed in subsidiary legislation. Others, we can put up guidance together with the Law Society to ensure that lawyers and uh, clients will be aware of this. Finally, as I mentioned at the outset, the bill emphasizes the possibility of an extension of the framework, uh, a point that I also covered, but specifically Mr. Lewis Hung asked how the framework will be flexible in catering to different categories of disputes. I think Mr. Murali asked how and what are the considerations we have as we consider the extensions of these, uh, this framework to other types of cases. Sir, the overarching CFA framework has been designed with the flexibility to, en to enable the framework to be expanded incrementally step by step after we study and we take into account views by stakeholders. The main tenets of the CFA framework will be set out and have been set out in this bill, supplemented by safeguards to be prescribed under subsidiary legislation. The categories of proceedings permitted by the CFA framework will also be set out in the subsidiary legislation. And we took this approach as we anticipated that the profile of litigants would be different for different categories of proceedings and different types of cases, and hence differentiated and targeted safeguards will be required. There will be flexibility to appropriately adjust the safeguards as we continue to monitor and refine the framework. Mr. Pillay's, to Mr. Pillay's point about the principal considerations and whether the same level of public consultation will be undertaken, the answer is yes, there will be. The difference in terms of where we are now today on the current framework and where we may expand it to. For lawyers, obviously, when you deal with and compete on the international fora with other foreign lawyers, we want to put our lawyers on the same footing. That may not apply in the context of domestic proceedings. For domestic proceedings, the main consideration now would be whether we can allow this so that there will be an enhancement to the access to justice. And those are the principal considerations. There may be more as we consult, but these are the driving considerations. Uh, and we will consult with key stakeholders uh, as we look at the landscape and determine whether it will be appropriate to extend this framework to also other types of cases to promote access to justice. In doing so, we will study also the profile of the likely litigants who will avail themselves of any such expansion and determine in those cases whether some additional form of protection might be necessary for the framework and if so, we will also prescribe that. Finally, let me address Mr. Thomas's observations on after-the-event insurance and its correlation to CFAs, particularly in other jurisdictions. Let me thank Mr. Thomas for his views and interests on the subject. The, my ministry is aware of the developments uh, outlined by Mr. Thomas, and we will review these developments as part of the holistic study of the litigation funding landscape. I would add that after-event uh, insurance is not peculiar only to, and not relevant only to CFAs. Uh, they are relevant across the board and uh, generally supplement and support the litigation funding landscape. So we'll study the after-event insurance in that context and look at whether or not any moves need to be made on that front. So I believe I've covered uh, all the queries raised by members, both general as well as specific. My ministry, as I said, will continue to re review the, the reforms, 
proposed in this bill uh, for future expansion and what other safeguards would be necessary. But we believe that the introduction of a CFA framework in this form has the potential to bring multifaceted benefits. It provides a further avenue for litigants to pursue meritorious claims and levels the playing field for our lawyers, particularly on the international setting. It will also signal Singapore's progressiveness and our responsiveness to the needs and the realities of the industry and further enhance Singapore's status as a premier first-class dispute resolution hub. We will at the same time continue to monitor the impact of the various reforms, keeping our finger on the pulse of developments and lessons learned in other jurisdictions and apply them contextually to Singapore. I assure members that we will continue to stay responsive and engage in active dialogue amongst all stakeholders as we study the progress of our initial framework and look at the extent to which this might be extended to other proceedings. So with that, I beg to move. Any clarifications? The question is that the bill be now read a second time. As many as of the opinion say aye. To the contrary, say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Committee stage, Legal? what day? I'm oh, sorry. Clock. Legal profession amendment bill. Committee stage, what day? Now, sir, I beg to move that Parliament will immediately resolve itself into a committee on the bill. The question is that Parliament will immediately resolve itself into a committee on the bill. As many as have their opinion say aye. Aye. To the contrary, say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question is that Clause 1 stands part of the bill. As many as of that opinion say aye. Aye. To the contrary, say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clause 2, Minister. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move that the amendment standing in the name of the Minister for Law as indicated in the order paper supplement. I had earlier in my speech explained the reasons and the rationale for making this amendment. The question is, the question is as proposed by the member, as many as of the opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clause 2 as amended. The question is that Clause 2 as amended stands part of the bill. As many as of the opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question is that Clauses 3 to 7 stand part of the bill. As many as of the opinion say aye. Aye. To the contrary, say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Bill to be reported. Minister for Law. Mr. Speaker, I beg to report that the bill has been considered in committee and agreed to with amendment. Third reading, what day? Now, sir, I beg to move that the bill be now read a third time. The question is that the bill be now read a third time. As many as have of that opinion say aye. Aye. To the contrary, say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Legal profession amendment bill. Mm. 